Sure, my name is David Zaritsky from The Bond Experience. How are you doing, David? Good, Daniel, how are you? Good to see you again. Very good, thanks, and you? Good, yeah, so I thought we would start with a nice, easy, simple question. What do you think? Yeah, please. <laughs> I that Good. Which suggests to me it's not going to be easy at all. No, no, no. I'm I'm not joshing you. So basically, my channel is about Bond style. So I yes. thought I would ask you a style question. Go for um, it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So as I watched No Time to Die twice, by the way, uh, the one thing that was occurring to me was, you know, when you think about the uh, the cars and the watches, but especially the clothing, there has to be a process where you and Sudarat, because I know you're passionate about the clothing that Bond wears, whether it's retirement or when he's on duty finally. What is that process like? How do you choose these clothes? Um, it's a long, long conversation. And, you know, Sudarat is, you know, how, uh, you know, just incredibly good at her job. And we, we meet up months before was as, as far away from the beginning of the shoot as we can possibly make it. Um, and I know we did, um, Ms. Suterat, um was on the job for, oh, got a year before we started shooting. Um, so we had lots of conversations. We met up in, in, in a hotel in Brooklyn. She brings racks of clothes and we kind of look through them and we kind of think, and at that point, I mean, it's complicated on a bomb movie, but all of them, um, because we never have a complete script at that point. So we have kind of rough ideas of temperatures, <laughs> like mm. where we're going to be. <laughs> so is it hot? Is it cold? Is it, you know, I mean, that's kind of, that's really, um, and that sort of goes back a long way, because at one point we were going to spend a lot of time in the cold in this movie. So we were talking about which cold weather clothes we were going to wear and, and what mm. we wanted to, what, what, what the images, what, I, we did, and what I love working with Sutera about is she loves vintage, um, uh, like rare vintage sort of clothing, uh, and going back a little further um, than you normally would, and looking at pieces that sort of sit in museums now, military clothing and um, stuff that um, I just she got she's got these great uh, reference books which have just got sort of pieces like they're one offs. Like air, you know, air, air, early airmen uniforms and stuff, uh, and that that was never so. Uh, we with the with the with the clothing that I wear at the end of of No Time to Die, that was really where we spent a lot of time and a lot of energy looking at reference material for that. We had pants made, and the idea was I wanted to refer back to his naval background, but I wanted it to be with a twist. I didn't want it to be just like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like a, a stock uniform. It had to look like a, a uniform that he'd sort of gathered over the years. We used a couple of references of um, special forces, but sort of older special forces, like from the sort of 50s, as opposed to the kind of guys now all suited up with the flak jackets and all the kind of, you know, we, I didn't want that look. I, did, I really kind of, I didn't want that. I'd, I've seen that so many times in movies. I just didn't want it. And I wanted a silhouette that sort of said something a bit more about this is the gear he keeps at home. And when it's time to go to business, he gets it out of the wardrobe. And that's what he sticks on. And that's what he feels comfortable in. It's like his, his lucky underwear, you know, <laughs> it's like this is his lucky clothes. These are his lucky clothes. So uh, so we did lots of work on that. Like The, the sweater I wear is an N peel um, that we had. A, we had an old sweater. Um, from the 60s, I think it is. It's a, and it was it was dark blue and N peel copied it and individualized it and made it kind of something special and, and again with the pants they were they were made uh, so, yeah, so yeah. you you always have a way your your tenure is what i call the terrestrial bond like of this earth you know it's not right. somebody with a, a red cape and what i love about that is when you describe bonds have these clothing in your retirement you've got a t-shirt with holes in it you know you've yeah. got in your garage yeah. you've got a rack of clothing behind your aston martin it yeah. it feels more human and in this film has a lot right. of humanity to it. Yeah, I just, you know, I just feel like, um, I feel like that the, the, there is a, um, it's, you know, it's a sort of selfish um, thing, really. I love big blockbuster movies. I love the kind of like the, you know, the spectacle of big blockbuster movies. I'm front and center when, when those movies come out. And, 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 and I, but it, they've got to touch you in some way. 
And I think it's just kind of like the, the, the digging into the humanity of those people. And, you know, especially with Bond, for me, it was, like, important to show that he's fallible. He's, like, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's, he's kind of flawed and, and makes mistakes. But at, his, at the heart of it, I always felt like he's a good person. He's honorable. He tries to do the right thing. He loves people. Really, when it boils down to it, he's not the best company sometimes, but he kind of loves people, and he wants to protect the world. I mean, it's kind of like, that's sort of easy. And then sort of like trying to kind of whack the, get the humanity into that is just kind of my job as an actor, you know? Well, it's, it's interesting because I think Fleming wrote him like that as fallible and flawed so people could un understand this is somebody that I can identify with. You know, it's not this yeah. person that you can't project yourself upon. Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, Fleming's relationship with him was very complicated. I mean, Fleming hated him, I think, at times, and tried to kill him off. And, but I thought that was all really useful kind of information, you know, to sort of like, uh, you know, to sort of put into the character. I've got to tell you that um, I myself, amongst a thousand people, uh, have used you and emulated in a fitness challenge, uh, when I was uh, about 2006, when you came out of the water, I know this is crazy. Oh, okay. uh, I, I started to get into the best shape of my life. You wouldn't recognize me back then. And a lot of right. people have used you and Simon Waterson, your trainer, to really yeah. do this whole idea of a Bond 25 fitness challenge. Uh, but yeah. for you, I think it's always been important for you to be a very fit Bond, but still be able to move well. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I look. You know, there was a there was a um, you know that Simon came on board really early on. You know, thank God. I mean, I have not been I wouldn't have been able to do the movies without him. Um, and we had a discussion early on. And I just said, look, I I, I need to change my shape. Um, I was pretty fit. I wasn't terribly unfit. I, I I went to the gym, but probably not enough. And I smoked back then, and I didn't eat the right food. And you know. And I just said, I need, to, I, I need him to look like he's just come out of the service, like special forces. I want him to look like he's, mm -hmm. he was a, a killer. And that's where we started. And, 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 but also to get fit and be able to do the stunts and keep fit um, um, while doing it. And, 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 you know, and I've injured myself so many times over it. But I've never really stopped filming because I was in such good shape. And I could carry the injuries through the film. And that's down to Simon. Yeah, so it's not always about just the looks. It's practical as well, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, a, bit about, a bit about the looks. <laughs> <laughs> we can't ignore that part, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it was interesting, the second time that I saw this film and I saw them literally one after another, I, I stepped back and I took a look at your tenure as Bond and I saw some really profound themes, betrayal, trust. Mm -hmm. But it mm. seems like you very purposely, and of course the writers and the director, amped up the trust aspect this time around. That had to be purposeful. Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, you know, we kind of hark back to Casino Royale and his relationship with Vespa and the betrayal and, you know, his, you know, uh, that he felt, um, you know, he fell in love and, you know that's that's in the book. I mean, it's not it's not like something we invented. So, but it was it was it felt powerful in that film, and it felt like something we needed to revisit. Um, and in fact, you know that betrayal has formed the previous three movies. I mean, that's like that's been the impetus for the past three movies. So it felt like we I I, I wanted, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to come back because I felt like we should kind of wrap that up. We need to wrap that up and put that to bed. Um, so I, I think we've done it in this movie. I think we did. You know, I think we managed to managed to do that. But it's a, uh, it, it, it's such a, uh, and I, you know, and also the fact that I had the the, the 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 privilege of being able to tell one story through all of them. That's never happened before. So to link all five movies was a was a, was a, a real. We tried sometimes to make standalone movies. We thought no no no, we'll make a standalone movie. It doesn't refer to anything. And we always came back to this where he was, who he was, why he was formed, and it always went back to Casino Royale. So. And it, you did it amazingly successfully. I mean, it just it was oh, it was a lot of fun. It was a, a real cracker. I, hope so. I mean, it's a Bond movie first and foremost. And we have to remember that. So, you know, I didn't. We didn't go out to make Hamlet. Uh, we just and I think I, I think we succeeded in making a great Bond movie. But you know, there's a, there's a there's a very good storyline in there as well. 
Well, it's funny you say that too, because when I was talking to Barbara, I was asking, you know, you you have all the tropes in there. So all the Bond fans are going check, 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 you know, gun barrel yeah. check. Um, yeah. But you stretch the formula yeah. pretty significantly. Yeah. Was there ever concern where you sat back one night and said, oh, I, I, yeah. did I stretch it too far? Or were you like push? You don't know. You don't ever really know. You just sort of kind of go for what you think is going to be good. Um, you know, you try and... Um, uh, I, I, listen, I've never been one for gadgets. Everybody's been, where are the gadgets in your movies? And I'm like, eh, where are gadgets, smadgets. But uh, Carrie's really got an eye for that and a really, really good keen eye for that. And I think what he did and brought, they're there now in abundance. And that's sort of very, it's, it's, you know, it's, I love it. I mean, I, you know, um, I'm kind of, I, I watch that uh, this movie now I go, oh, I really miss them. <laughs> um, so it's uh, stuff like that. And I, I, we, we pushed it, hopefully not too far, but we pushed it as far as we could, I think. The gadgets are back, the cars are back. What I also found was back was humor. The way yeah. humor is woven, and I almost found it, I'm gonna use this term, I almost found it as a palate cleanser because it's a very emotional story. Yeah. Listen, you know, I've always wanted there to be fun in it. Um, it's tough writing these movies, really tough. It's, all, it's also really tough writing gags because the gags that have been before, they're funny. I mean, some of them are great, but they're kind of, they're what, they're kind of, they've become sort of legendary, you know, like the whatever, whether Rogers lines or whatever. They're kind of, and we could never recreate that. We could never, um, I'd never want to emulate that. What I always have said and I've tried to sort of get in as much as possible is some wit. And we lucky enough to get Phoebe involved, and you know she's witty, intelligent, yes. and and that unlocked things. You know, a lot of those lines in there are Phoebe's. There's other lines that, um, that the guys wrote um, that are in there, but a lot of them are improvised as well by the actors because she unlocked something that people could feel a freedom. And I think that's where the best lines come from. Uh, often is is, yeah. is sort of a combination of great writing, but also of of of, of improvisation. So that, I think we, yeah, I'm very happy with uh, what the way it turned out. I could absolutely sense her DNA in the yeah. dialogue. It was fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I have to say, at the end of Being James Bond, the documentary that you did, you have a mm -hmm. wonderful and very emotional thank you uh, to the cast. And I, I want to I be very transparent with you, Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, I became a little beclept. <laughs> I became emotional. I yeah. feel like I've been on this journey with you. And then when Barbara hugged you, um, I yeah. lost it right. as a fan. I really did. Oh, man, that's great. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. It, it, it was so, <laughs> it, no, no, it was so incredible. I, I, it's not even a question. I, I want to thank you. I don't know how many people talking to you today are just outright thanking you, but you've lifted people up in the last 15 years during some dark times. My gosh, during a pandemic, you've created such entertainment that will last generations. You've been our badass bond. You've been our emotional bond. You've been a bond that we can identify with. And I just want to thank you oh, so much for doing it. Thank you. That's very, very lovely of you. Thank you. And hopefully you'll enjoy this particular moment. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do my best. I'm, I'm, it's pretty good. I'm here and we've got the chance to celebrate, uh, which I didn't think we would. Um, and that's, that's, that's a, just such a big bonus. And to see the cast and the crew and to, you know, to, to just sort of thank everybody because I genuinely thought we wouldn't get here. So it's true. And amidst the rain, I was on the red carpet with you, and it was there a celebratory go. mood for sure. It had to rain, really, didn't it? <laughs> it's good luck, right? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, I think so. That's what they say. If it rains on your wedding day, it's good luck. So that's right. Yeah. Daniel, thank you for everything. I really appreciate yeah. it. Pleasure. Cheers. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. So I had to um I had to do a post discussion, right? After you just saw that, because Right. I mean, I, I wanted to talk about kind of behind the scenes of this. And look, the reality is, is I've never been part of a press junket. I mean, this is this is wonderfully insane for me. When I did hear the news that I was going to be a part of a press junket, uh, which was, by the way, very last minute, I mean, with hardly any notice, there were a couple of things that went through my mind. First of all, I became very excited. Uh, I became incredibly honored and humbled. 
But I also became a little anxious, like what would I ask? I mean, these are professional interviewers out there, journalists asking these questions. What on earth would I ask? But I'm wearing a t-shirt for a reason because the Bond experience has always been about, you know, these, these moments, one moment at a time living like Bond. And I had to be authentically myself. I couldn't put this, you know, veneer of a professional interviewer. I wanted to ask things that I wanted to know from Daniel Craig, things like style, things like moments in the filming. You know, what, what did he think about when making the choices? Does he think about the fans? All those things I wanted to know. And I thought that if, if I just was very authentic in my questions, like if I sat down for 15 minutes with Daniel Craig, you know, what would I want to know? then you might enjoy it as well. So this is an incredibly surreal thing. And by the way, the process of a press junket, I didn't know anything about it. So I went into it totally blind, but it was so incredibly organized. You know, first of all, you go into a Zoom, this big Zoom with a lot of different faces and everything like that, and that's the holding room. That's where they take you into these breakout rooms to get your technology in order. They make sure that your camera looks good, the audio looks good. Um, they go over certain rules and regulations, like no spoilers, et cetera. Then they bring you back into that holding room, and then you wait for another link that takes you into, wait for it, another holding room, where you wait for the different interviewer, uh, interviewee, I should say. And then there's a bit of a countdown, they tell you to get ready, but sometimes you could sit in there for 10, sometimes 25 minutes, silence, just looking at the screen. and there was very little warning. Um, with Daniel, for example, uh, it was all of a sudden, boom, I was in. And then he was up on the screen and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And they ask you to say your name and your slate or what channel you're from or where you're from, et cetera. And then you're off to the races. You don't hesitate, you just go and you make the most of your 15 minutes. And that was the other thing too. I didn't know I was gonna get 15. I thought, I'll be so lucky to get five, you know, maybe seven at best, but 15 minutes, that's a decent long time and I felt, just a few minutes into it, like we were actually having a conversation. It wasn't a press junket. These were two gentlemen just talking about Bond, both enjoying Bond moments. So this was amazing. I wanted to share it with you, especially, my gosh, this date. You know, this is right on the cusp of Global James Bond Day. And the reality is, is that the Bond community is a global community where we all stem from the enjoyment of James Bond. So for me to, to put out this video, this interview today, to have a, a, absolutely a, a wish list checked off of interviewing dedicatedly, one-to-one, -one, Daniel Craig, uh, is a joy for me, and I hope you enjoyed it too. And we'll be bringing you more surprises to come very, very shortly, because it's a continued celebration of this moment. All right. Well, in the meantime, this has been David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from The Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.